Hey, I'm Christy Friesen, and I'm here at the Cool Tools Studio. And you know what we should make? We should make a butterfly because I was out in the meadow here at Cool Tools and there's just flowers and butterflies flitting all over the place. And I thought, hey, we could make an amazing little butterfly pendant out of polymer clay and then coat it with swellagen. Doesn't that sound like fun? All right, I'm gonna walk you through all the steps. Are you ready? Okay, here's what you're gonna need. Obviously, you're gonna need polymer clay, and as you can tell, we don't need much of it. This is just sort of like an ecru, but it really doesn't matter what color you choose because we're gonna coat it with swellagant, which is gonna make it look like metal. So then this is a little bit of a release powder. You can use cornstarch or a little bit of pigment powder, whatever makes you happy. I'm gonna use a bit of 20 gauge wire. This is bronze wire. Something uncoated is the best, but you know, whatever you've got, it'll be fine. And that, a little bit of that, you won't need much, and something to cut it with. Your teeth, not recommended. Then these are the other tools we'll need. Uh, a paintbrush for applying the, the powder to make the textures not stick. Some sculpting tools, uh, your random favorite ones, these are my favorite ones, uh, cutting blades of some sort. Then we're looking at these rubber mats, texture sheets, stamp sheets, whatever you want to call them. An assortment of nice, deep patterning so that it'll make a really good impression. For polymer and other clays and metal and resin and epoxy, you can get away with just about any level of depth in your design. But if we're going to put the swellagant on top, which we will, that's a rather thick paint-like material. So you want something deep enough so that it doesn't get closed up by the paint we're going to apply. All right, so here you go. Here's what we need. Let's get started and make a polymer butterfly. All right, so I have conditioned this clay, and all that means is it's soft and flexible and ready to use. And the first thing I want to do is I want to make four little balls of clay, roughly equal size, for the wings. Now I'm kind of just winging it, no pun intended, um, because I think it's kind of fun to do a free form. If you feel better with like a template and sketching it out ahead of time and keeping it within a certain size and shape parameter, then you go for it. But if you just want to let your inner child out and get kind of wild with it and see what happens, then that is awesome. So the first trick is to make four balls of clay that are about the same size. After your first 27 dozen, it's really easy just to eyeball it, but you may have to kind of measure and cut. Don't freak out about it. If they're not exactly the same, it's all right. Now I make a ball with the clay for two reasons. One, I want to check the size, but two, it's a good time to pick out the random cat hairs, make sure there's no wrinkles and creases, and just make sure everything looks good. And this also warms it up in your hand, which makes polymer a lot easier to play with. Now you'll notice what I'm doing here. I'm doing a little karate chop to make this into a teardrop shape. By the way, you see how there's some marbling? Don't worry about it. We're going to get that all covered up. Don't feel like you have to do that too. I just got lazy and I didn't blend it all the way. But that's not something you need. All right, so I'm going to do two of these with that little karate chop trick. So look, I've got two teardrops there. Let's do them all like that, because why not? Okay. If you end up having a giant snake and not a teardrop, that means you're not wedging your hand in that nice little karate chop. You're just rolling it like this. So play with it till you get it right. Now, you're gonna flatten with your fingers. But you say, hey, wait, won't that leave fingerprints? And the answer is yes. That's okay. What we're doing is a butterfly, which means fingerprints are going to add a nice organic texture. So it's all good. So what I'm trying to do is just make sure that these are similar in size and they're still quite thick. That's because I haven't finished shaping them yet. I'm kind of doing this in stages. It's easier when you're trying to make something symmetrical to kind of do the same step on all of them first instead of completely making one and then wondering, how the heck did I do that? All right, so now we're going to have four little wings. Eventually, there'll be a butterfly body in the middle of that. So now what to do? First thing I would suggest is go Google butterfly and take a look at how many wings there are. There are all kinds of shapes. So what I want now is to pinch this a little thinner, make this a little bigger so it's a bit more delicate, and maybe add some interesting little shapes to that. So see how I've kind of pushed it in here and there with my finger, continue to flatten it, 
with my fingers. You think, well, why don't you just like roll it all out and cut the shapes out? You can do that. That's not a problem. But I love how it looks when you kind of hand do it. It makes a delightful irregularity that I personally find very fun. So now the trick is going to be to try and make this one look like it belongs on the same butterfly so that these wings are similar. So I'm going to kind of hold that side by side, see if one is a little bit bigger than the other. If it's one's bigger than the other, all you have to do is kind of pull on your clay a little bit and it should be okay as long as they're both about the same thickness. Okay, that seems reasonable, don't you think? Now we're going to do the same here, only I'm thinking we're going to go sort of swallow tail. So look what I'm doing is I'm sort of pinching and pulling so that now you have a liver or whatever shape that organ is. And we have a little bit longer, little bit of a tail here, which is very butterflyful. Let's do that. That looks good. Now, see if I can make the other one look the same. All I did was pinch and pull and pinch and pull. Don't get too crazy because you want to keep this all nice and flat. You can always lay one on top of the other to see where your shape needs to be adjusted so that they're similar. That's about the same length, almost right. What do you think? Does this look like a reasonable deconstructed butterfly? I think so. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put texture. I've got all these textures out here because I want variety. I want there to be a couple different things going on. So my advice to you then is to buy as many texture sheets as your budget will allow. And a little hint there, ramen's nice. If you have more ramen, you have more money for texture sheets. Just saying. All right, so I'm going to pull these over here and I'm going to pull this fun one up. Look at that nifty thing. I'm going to press this up. Wait, did you see I almost put it right on there? Oh no, you don't want to do that because rubber, unlike silicone, rubber and clay form a very unhealthy relationship and they never separate after a while. So what I'm going to do is take some kind of a powder and it can be pigment powder, it can be cornstarch, just anything to release the rubber and the clay. So we got that kind of spread on out. Now, of course, that makes it for less pretty design, but I think we can see that's going to work. So I'm going to press that in, keep it away from the border. And you see how I'm putting the clay on top and then pressing. This is also going to make your wing just a little bit bigger than it was before. So take that into consideration. And ideally, what you want is a really deep, clean impression. If it doubles up or gets skewed or something looks stupid about it, just try it again. Pull it off, shape it again, and try again. I'm going to make the same pattern on both because that's going to be more symmetrical. Then I'll use something different over here. So let's do this over here and do it exactly the same. Again, I'm pressing it down. I'm using firm pressure without feeling like you have to smash it in there forever, but you want to get a good firm impression. And then I'm peeling the clay off the sheet and you can put another bit of powder in there if you need to. If any powder remains on the surface of the clay, don't worry about it. By the time we get going with our swell again, you'll never even know it. All right. That looks acceptable. Now I'll put those aside and let's look at all these other ones we've got here. Now I'm liking this pattern in here, but I think that might look good on the body of my butterfly. So I'll save that. And do I want this to mesh with this thing or with these crazy things? Kind of your call, but let's go with this one. I think that will work. Powder up. Whee! That should work. You don't need big gunks of powder, just enough. And let's push that in here. What do you think? That's going to work, I think. Press, 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 just like we did. Let's peel it. Gentle peel. Oh yeah, look at that. And look at how these look together. That's kind of fun, huh? Okay, we'll do it one more time. See, I've got a little bit of clay sticking, so that means I just need a bit more powder. And press it on. Excellent. Gentle peel. Woohoo! Okay, two bottom wings, two top wings. That's going to look pretty fun. All right, so now let's get started with the body. All you're going to do for the body is take another ball of clay, and I'm going to make kind of a thick 
log, just to see if I've got proportion right. I'm gonna make this thinner, but that's a little too short for that lovely little guy. So let's get some more on here. Roll my ball again. Again, looking it all over, no cracks, no dust. Cat hairs, we're good. Roll it a little thinner. And this is gonna be thicker than it needs to be, but I'm just sort of looking for size. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the head first. Let's move these out of my way. So what I want to do for the head is I want to take one of my tools, and this is the can't live without it tool, because you so can't live without this. And what I like about that is the barrel of this tool is stainless steel, so it feels good in your hands. It works great no matter what material you're using, metal clay, polymer clay, whatever. But this is a really nice way of pressing in a little indentation. And you said, well, what if I just use this cheaper paintbrush? Yeah, you can do that too. But you're going to love this tool, I'm just saying. So let's roll it there. And now what I've done is I've made a little head and a little neck, but we've got to get our fingers in there and just make that more rounded so that this looks nice and smooth and not machine made kind of a thing. So see how more organic that looks. Now, if you remember your seventh grade science and all of your stuff about bugs, you'll remember that bugs have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, which is just a chest, head, and a butt. So what we're gonna do is squeeze in that waist area to separate the chest from the body, which is a butterfly thing. So you can use the same tool, but I tend to use my fingers for this part to make it a little bit more elongated. Now we're gonna bring this back and just see what our shapes look like. These things are gonna end up being in that middle section, so I wanna see if that proportionately looks good or if there's too much body for this butterfly. Okay, so he's got a bit more tail than we want, so let's just chop a little of that off. Bye-bye with my blade, and then I'm just going to reform this with fingers. And I'm just kind of slowly pinching and pressing. You've got all the time in the world. The heat of your fingers is what makes all of that stuff just blend so sweetly. All right, so now squish his chest. Let's put a little texture on the body, add some eyes, and assemble it, and we'll be ready to go. So I think we talked about this one being fun, so let's get some texture in there. Let's press that right in here. So chest into my circle pattern. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the body because the body, that chest is gonna get mostly covered with wings. So we wanna make sure we have some more pattern, more bang for our buck. All right, there we go. Aw, perfect. Now, eyeballs. All we do for eyes are two little balls. Butterflies have big eyes, so you can have them pretty big. And we're gonna put them on the side of the head. If you put them on the top or the front, it just looks like a cartoon, which may be the look you're going for, but secretly I'll be judging you. So let's just get these two little balls and stick them on the sides and press them in like little Princess Leia buns. And there we go. Now, one press, two press, Let's put this one underneath here a little bit. Tuck it under. So I haven't pressed it too hard so I can make my changes. What do you think? Uh, let's put it all together. Pressing it on. So see how this isn't quite symmetrical there? Let me move that in just a little bit more. And there we go. Perfect, look at our butterfly, look at how pretty, and look at all that plethora of texture. So the only thing left to do is add his antenna and I'm gonna just trim a little piece here. Now, you can make these pieces have uh, curly cues at the end if that amuses you. Um, a little round nose plier can work. I'm just gonna take this tool and kind of bend a little curve on the end. Not much, because we can always put that in afterwards. In fact, I think I'll do that. We'll put that in afterwards, because then we can get it just how we want it. We're gonna just press that into place right in the forehead. So see, there's his forehead, stick it in. And we'll do the same on this one, just that little teeny bit of a bend, and move it around later. So I'm just curving it with my fingers. And let's get that in there. Symmetry can come later. Okay, press that in. Yeah, so you've got like a little crinkle in there, we'll fix that because we don't want any crinkles. Okay, so now take a look. 
we have a lovely textured piece made out of polymer clay ready to bake. Now, one more thing before we bake. How are you gonna wear this? There's a couple things you can do. The easiest is just to press a hole in the outer wing and string it from there. You can also put a little hoop on the back side, but I'm gonna go ahead and just add my little stringing hoops, uh, stringing holes right here, and then I can use a jump ring later and attach that to a chain or a ribbon or whatever amuses me. So I'm just using my tool and opening up a little hole right there. If you forget to do that before you bake, fear not, polymer clay, is really easy to drill, so you can just use a little handheld or electric drill and zzz, zzz, put that in there. If you wanna put the little hanger on the back, don't do it now, because by the time you flip it over and smash it on there, you're gonna mess up all this stuff. That can be attached when you're all done with a little bit of E6000 glue. Okay, into the oven it goes, and we will soon have a wonderful butterfly to turn into a metallic beauty. Okay, so now you've gotten your butterfly out of the oven, the polymer's all cured, ready to go. It's time to turn it into metal. Hmm, which metal shall we use? There's so many to choose from. I have an idea. Let's make it copperlicious. Okay, so here is our copper coating for Swelligant, and I shook it up really good. Don't forget to shake it because those minerals settle to the bottom. That is pulverized copper in there, so you wanna make sure it's thoroughly blended. And then I put some of it in this nice little condiment cup, something that I can use and go back and forth to put the lid on when I'm not using it. And the first step is just to coat it with a single coating. And you may not be able to cover all the cracks and crevices. This is sometimes can be thin, sometimes it's thick. Each time it's a little different depending on how long it's sat around, things settle, sometimes the air goes out of it because you've opened it before in your studio. So if it's too thick, you can just use a little distilled water to thin it down. It should be the consistency of salad dressing. Nice, good, creamy Italian. And now we're just gonna dab all over but if there are thin spots, we're gonna come back and fix those with our coating number two. You'll also note that I'm kind of doing more of a dabbing motion than a stroking motion. This just helps the, uh, the metal coating go down into all the cracks and crevices and leaves some nice little hills and valleys that later on the patina can wander into. Now, if you like, you can go ahead and paint the antenna if you've used a coated wire which just means the non-tarnish they have a like a varnish on them to keep them from getting tarnished um, go ahead and put some swelligant on that if like this it's an uncoated wire leave it because the swelligant patinas will cover right on top of them okay make sure you don't have any little thick globs any place and let that dry now if you're like me, letting things dry on their own, oh, so boring. So well, I'm gonna hit it with a heat gun and I'll be ready for a second coating just to make sure I've filled in all the gaps thoroughly. Then after that, we'll come back and we'll watch the process of putting the patina on. All right, so now we have multiple layers of copper. They're dry, they're ready to go. And remember from your other videos how I mentioned that in order for the patina to interact with the metal, the metal has to be moist. You remember that. So now I'm gonna go back and get more copper and I'm gonna go quickly because I have a lot of area to cover. So just feel quick when you do this. Oops, oops, doo, 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 doo. And if you sing something really fast, la, da, 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 see that, that helps you just move faster. So no mellowness right now, all zoomy, zoom, zoom. Okay. I think we got it, excellent. Now you have a couple of ways to put that patina on there. One way would be just to dip it in your brush and pour it all over, but I took my darkening patina this time and I put it inside of a little mister bottle and I'm gonna give it a sprit all over. So I've got it on a paper towel here just to soak up any excess from flying all over the universe. And now look, watch that darkening is beginning to happen. Isn't that exciting? So what's gonna happen is, especially in all those cracks and crevices, it's gonna darken up quite a bit. It's just gonna keep on going, keep on going. Anywhere along the line on this process, if you want to dip it into a little bowl of water and kind of swish it a little bit and bring it back out and pat it dry, you can, because this is not a dye. This isn't a paint, this is a chemical reaction. And that reaction is happening when the patina hits the metal. Can you see here how it's doing especially fun? Nice and dark over there, a little less on this side. No one knows why. I'm sure it has something to do with science. Anyway, we're gonna let that go for another minute or two. This process takes about five minutes, that's all. Then I'm going to dry it with my heat gun and we're gonna get fun with all of the dyes that can make color really pop on this baby. 
Okay, so look at how awesome that looks. That is just putting the darkening on. I blotted away the excess and I just used my heat gun on it to make everything dry quickly. Now you could be done just like that. I mean, that's fantastic. But I like to make that little rub just to sort of pop the highlights. And the reason we do that is if this was a solid copper, let's say you made that out of copper clay, then once you've used the patina, which works fantastic on the metal clays, by the way, you'd come back with sandpaper or a uh, Dremel buffing uh, light grind or whatever and grind away or buff away some of the surface of that patina. But we only have two little thin layers of metal coatings. If we do that, we're down to whatever the clay color underneath was, and that's no fun. So instead, I'm gonna just stick my gloved finger into my metal and I'm using a very porous paper towel to get rid of the excess moisture because I want just a paste that I can smear over the surface. And what that's gonna do <clears throat> is it's going to revitalize the top with more bright copper. And the more layers I put on here, the shinier and the shinier it'll get. See the difference between the two sides? Just a little shinier, a little shinier really pops the highlights there. All right, keep on going on to the other side. I like to move it so that I can swipe this way because that is getting on the tops of things, not down into those cracks and crevices. If you overdo it and you're like, oh darn it, I got a big blob right in there. You can always just recover it and re-darken it. You saw how quick that process was. It's not, it's not hard, you can do it. And then let's see if that's as shiny as I want it to be. I think it is. Especially you can see in some places like this, see how that just gets, <clears throat> that just gets shinier and shinier the more copper coating I put on top of that. <gasps> Yummy. Okay, groovy baby, are you ready for the next process? And that is taking this fabulous butterfly, which you could leave just as is, and adding some dyes to it to make it even more fun. Okay, so we're gonna play with dyes. These are the ones I'm using, but you can use whatever you like. These are the little mini size. So I've got violet and blue and red and some chartreuse and some white. And of course, I've put them all in these nice little containers to, to play with. Now, here's the thing. These are all like watercolor. They're water soluble. That means as you put them on, you can use water to move them around. Once they dry, they're still water soluble. So you can continue to move them all around. That's wonderful for blending. The drawback is once you go to put your coating on top, then they are gonna move. They're gonna rehydrate and kind of move a little bit if you're not careful. So there's a workaround. What you can do is use the Swellingant Sealant, which is this little guy right here. That's our clear urethane coating. It's, it's a completely flat finish. There's no shine to this. But if you put a few drops of that in each one of your colors, now those colors become water soluble while they're wet but they become completely hard once they're dry, which means you can still add more sealant over the top, but they won't move around. So that's usually the trick that I do is I add a little bit of this, anywhere from a 10 to a 50% ratio, depending on how light you want those colors to be. If you want them to be intense, you use a little less. But for now, we're just gonna play with this because if you add some spray coating to the top, that's gonna seal it when it's all done and then you can continue to add more coating. So I think we're gonna be okay. So what I wanna do is I've got white here, but I want more of a, a violet color. So I'm actually gonna dip right into this and mix a little bit of purple in with my white to get more of a lavender color. So just like watercolors, these things all kind of mix and match, but they don't do it exactly the same way as watercolors. They're, once you get on the metal, it does a little different thing. So you're gonna have to experiment and see what you come up with. But now look at how fun this is. Now you notice that I'm not being too careful whether I'm, I'm over the lines or anything, because that trick that we just did with the a copper at the, t at the end to brighten it all up, I can do that once the dyes are done. I can add that again and recopperize the whole shabam. So I can have a lot of play time with this because I'm just filling in the gaps. Now it looks pretty intense, doesn't it? When this dries, a lot of the intensity of that color will go away. This is on purpose. These, they're dioxides. They're made to work as an oxide with the patina, but they're also made to have um, a lot of naturalness so that you can blend it into your clay to your liking. You may want a whole lot of color or you may want not so much color. And this is allowing that to happen because it soaks in and lightens so you can just keep on 
making it deeper and deeper as you wish. So I'm going to take a little bit of my Q-tip or paper towel or wet wipe and just get rid of some of that extra there. There's a little bit more than I wanted here and there. So yeah, you might think, well, red and purple, that's a weird choice. Well, I just feel like it, okay? Gosh. Anyway, we're going to put a little bit more of that. This rut is very much vermilion, so it's in that purple family. So I feel justified in my color choices today. Now let's see if we can make a little bit of this green happen in here. I haven't decided if the greens will look better on the body ooh, or into the wings. Well, I guess it decided for me it's going to do both. Let's get just a little on the head. Now that looks messy, right? So let's go back and let's clean up a little. I'm going to take my towel. I'm going to get it minimized on those wings. I don't like it there as much after all. And you can just brush it away with your wet. Get my brush, get it from where I don't want it. See how easy that is? So let's leave it mostly in the body and not so much in the wings. Convenient, huh? So look at how that's almost all gone now. Let's soak this in a little more. We don't have quite enough over there. Let's add a bit. So again, subtle color. This isn't like alcohol inks, which you can use with a swelligant. There's no reason why not. This is more of a lighter color that's going to soak into everything. Let's get a little really intense pur purple right in the middle of that body and up onto the head a little bit. So see, I'm using a lot of water. I'm moving things around with my brush. I'm constantly dabbing it off to the side where my towel is and just eliminating excess and you're building it up. If you put a bunch on there and you go, ugh, what was I doing? I hate this. You completely coat it with metal again and start again. What I have found is the more coatings I put on, both metal and dye, the more rich and intense and beautiful the end piece is. So you really can never overdo it. A thing I like to tell people is, number one, let out your mad scientist because that's what you're doing with this stuff. And number two is you cannot go wrong. There is nothing that you can do to this process that will screw it up because everything goes on top of everything else. Layer after layer, the more layers you put, the more fun. So don't feel intimidated, don't feel scared. Just play, you cannot mess up, guaranteed. All right, so now I've got a bunch of color all over the place. And again, remember, we've got that happy little final coat with copper to see what it looks like. I'm gonna let that dry a little and then I'm gonna hit it with the heat gun and just We'll see what that looks like, and then we'll give it that last bit of copper, pa-bam. Okay, so look at this. See how all of this soaked into the metal? Remember how intense it was, how red everything was? It's just soaked in, and it's much more subtle. And you may love it just like that. I like this reapplying of the copper paste at the top. Um, I just think it just kind of seals the deal. So I'm going to do one more layer. But I, I want you to know that if you wanted deeper, more intense, of coloring, then you just keep on going. You just keep adding more and more layers. It's not over till you say so. And like I said, if you screw up, it doesn't matter. You just add another layer or start from scratch and redo the whole thing and you'll see what you get. I love doing that. In fact, sometimes I'll put like a layer of something like iron first and then something like copper or brass because then I get a little bit of rust coming through the other green patina. So yeah, go a little crazy. This is all fun times. This is all mad scientist time for you. All right, so see what I'm doing? This last little bits of that copper. And imagine if you are a metal clay artist, how this would look on your metal clays. If you did a copper clay, you would get the exact same effect. And instead of adding this metal on the top, which of course you can do, because the metal coatings work beautifully on metal clay as well, you would instead just maybe grind it down a little bit. There we have our beautiful, beautiful dude. Look at that finished. Isn't that lovely? Okay, so once this baby is done and dry, I usually let it sit for 24 hours before I put any sealant on it. You can use any number of sealants, but I recommend something with some spray to it. This is the sealant that comes with the Swelligant uh, product line. It's a clear sealant for protection. It's a matte finish. It's flat. There's no shine to it. And I put a little bit of it in this um, spritzer bottle. Now you can see it has a bit of milkiness to it. So if you have any areas that you've put a little bit too much on, that milkiness will stay there. So I like to just give it a very gentle spritz and be done. In fact, I usually come back with my paper towel and just blot so there's no buildup of gook. 
and then I'll let that dry and come back and do it again, two or three coats, and it is going to completely protect all the metal coating so that it won't continue to oxidize over time or rub off on clothing and that sort of thing. Okay, wasn't that a blast? Don't you wanna just make like a whole flock of butterflies using every one of the colors, all of the dyes and all the metals? I know you do. So have fun with that. And if you wanna wear it, remember there's holes in the side to string it up or put a little pin in the wall through there, or you can turn it over and add a little hanging hook with some E6000 or something like that. Okay, happy butterfly collecting. Visit our learning center at cooltools.us for more cool jewelry making videos. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and be sure to sign up for our email list to be the first to hear about new videos, new products, and other cool stuff from Cool Tools.